Ellie. Ellie, when you called a couple of months ago and you invited me to come here tonight for a conversation, and I said, what do you want to talk about? And you said, whatever you want. I said, whatever I want, whatever you want. So I'm thinking about it, and what I would like to talk about is the simple subject of freedom. I'd like to talk about the word, the concept, where it probably got started, where was it written that it's a good idea that people should be free, and I end up thinking, because this has been in my mind for a while, that if you go back to the first commandment, which I am very impressed by and think about a lot, <laughs> I am the Lord thy God who brought thee forth out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and thou shalt have no other God before me. And I've always had the feeling that what God was saying was that I have introduced you to a path. I've put you on a path, bondage behind you, freedom ahead of you. And that is so important that you're entitled to only one God. And I'm wondering, what is your take on that first commandment and the concept of freedom? The first commandment, of course, is the basis of our faith. But does God say, I am your God? I am your God. And then he continues, let there be no other God for you. But for us, of course, the word are nothing. And actually, our sages tell us, Moses, when he had to give the Ten Commandments, couldn't say all the Ten Commandments. He couldn't even give the First Commandment. Mm. All he could say is he'd echo God's word, Anochi. The rest was a kind of a voice coming from heaven. He was so impressed, so taken by it, so moved, overwhelmed to speak like God. And well, therefore, you know, the word we have in Hebrew, in the Bible, too, two words for I. One is Ani. And that one's Anochi. Mm -hmm. With God, it's only Anochi. It's not the same words. God can say Anochi. I cannot say Anochi. Only a poet can say that, <laughs> bombastically. But, but only God can say that. God's language is, we are spending centuries and centuries of research and learning to understand God's language how many hundreds and thousands of books have been written on that, commentaries on his language. Why does God use language? After all, God has other means. God is all-powerful. It's not for his sake. It's for ours. But if it be for ours, and that first commandment of 10 relates, if I'm right, to the theory <clears throat> of freedom, the concept of freedom, are you aware in your own studies of a time prior to the drafting of the Ten Commandments, when the idea of freedom was talked about, why is it regarded as sort of the opposite of bondage? Why is it a positive thought? The people of Israel, which by the way to me is to this day an, an amazing phenomenon, uh, they are the only people of antiquity to have survived antiquity. Why? Why? And it has to do quite clearly with our relationship to language, to memory, and to the Bible, which is our passport. Mm -hmm. Passport to humanity, passport to eternity. Mm -hmm. That's our passport. And what is the Bible? The, main, the, the, I, the first five books are stories. All the others are laws. But the first five books are stories, adventurous stories, good for Hollywood. And Hollywood is misusing naturally. But what a story. And never, the, even then, it begins with the bait, with the B, says our, our sages tell us. Why not with the Aleph, with the A? If you say in the beginning, use at least, be logical, <laughs> and use an Aleph, an A. And the answer is, we cannot even begin, only God can. Mm -hmm. Whew, therefore, the, the, the first sentence, do you have any idea how many, Commentaries have been written on the very first sentence, where she bara Elohim, You have no idea. I'm a student of the Bible. The beauty in all that. 
So, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. First of all, that means settle it. We are here because God created heaven and earth. But our sages come and say, why did he do that? Why does God need all these games there? And more so, why did he create Adam, man? And the Talmudic sources are rich, rich. There were quarrels in angels, among the angels. The good angels say to God, ah, great, great man, he will do good. The bad angel said, Mr. God, what are you doing? <laughs> Don't you know that he's going to be a thief and a thing and that? Come on. <laughs> so God chose to listen to the ones, but not to the others. But ultimately, it's a story of a choice of freedom. But when you get into the analysis, and Jews are excellent at analyzing words, mm -hmm. when you get into the analysis, and a lot of this is written down now, what did the scholars of later years make of the concept of freedom? It's already there. Even in the Bible, we speak of freedom, of course. How does Jewish history begin its story? Mm -hmm. In Egypt. Yes. We were slaves. We were supposed to be 400 years, but God was merciful and reduced it to 210. And it, it began there. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of course, was our ancestors, but the ancestors of humanity as we see it. But Egypt formed us, shaped us. Uh, literature on, on that period also is amazing. We are supposed to believe that the Jews there, even in Egypt, as slaves, mm -hmm. under the cruel Pharaoh, observed mm -hmm. certain laws of the Bible, which hasn't been written. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath, for instance, they observed the Sabbath. Second, they spoke Hebrew. <laughs> Can you imagine? Who were the teachers in birth? Hebrew teachers. They spoke Hebrew among themselves. The language was as eternal as the Jewish people. But that is the beauty of the Talmud. I'm a student of the Talmud, and I love the Talmud. The beauty, that, the imagination in, in there. And uh, therefore, when it comes to Egypt, of course, what, what did the Jews do in Egypt? They were slaves, working very, very hard. And luckily, luckily, uh, Aaron had a sister called Miriam. And one day, she went just for a walk near the sea. And she's heard a child cry. She looked, ah, oh, there was a baby in a crib or something. That's how Jewish history begins. Mm -hmm. Crying, the tears of a child. So Miriam says, what? And she says something very beautiful. Ah, he cries, he must be a Jew. <laughs> he must be Jewish. In the beginning, I didn't like that. The Jew is he who cries? No. I think a Jew is he who sings. Somebody <laughs> might cry. But the child cries. But if one now looking back, we're well, looking back more than 2,000 years. Yeah. Right? More, 3,000 years. 3,000. 3,500 years. Um, in your own mind, what are the one or two legacies of Judaism that people all over the world today still deal with, perhaps without even knowing the origin? Well, first, monotheism. Monotheism. No doubt. Today you have billions of people who are monotheistic. In the beginning, there were very small people who believed that. Very, very small, the smallest of all nations. And now, what we have done, did we? Of course, because then came Christianity, Islam, they also believe in monotheism, but they did it in something else, but mm -hmm. they believe in one God. What else? What they believe in, or what we are doing. I think also the fact that I, the, the, the accent on memory. Memory. Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I don't know of many, many religious uh, ways and literature that preach memory the way we do. We insist on memory. Always remember it. Remember the Sabbath. Remember that you left Egypt. One of the most essential commandments for us is remember that you have left Egypt as a slave. Mm -hmm. Which means, look, you may have all the, all the beautiful houses, 
in, in Manhattan or, or in Paris, remember, you have been a slave. This is a good memory. Yes. The question that comes to my mind, if you go back to the beginning of the American experience with democracy, what we know when we read so many of the books that have come out in recent years about the founding fathers, these are people who spend a good bit of time with the Bible. Bible, yeah, yeah. And I wonder, and there's probably no evidence for this, but I wonder to what extent the concept of freedom as evolved in the first commandment is linked in some way or another to the first amendment in the United States Constitution. You got 10 commandments, you've got 10 amendments to mm -hmm. the Constitution, the first being a freedom amendment, that you are free to have your own religion, you gather, you can um, even have a free press and free speech. But freedom was something that the Founding Fathers put down first. Not self-defense, that came second, but first was the concept of freedom. and. Um, it may be too poetic and therefore not true, but when you go from Ten Commandments to Ten Amendments, and the first being the freedom concept, I want to believe, without the evidence, that there was some connection. Freedom to the basis. If, 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 I'm not, if I am not free, what's the big deal that I observe the law? If I'm not free to observe the law, and I do, <laughs> they make me observe the law. At the same time, we cannot, of course, see the paradox. When God speaks of us, he says, you have been my servants. Uh, many times, you have been my. And we say, Avadim Hayinu Pharaoh, we were slaves to Egypt. But God says, you have, you have been my servants. He calls us my servants. Why? Why indeed? Indeed. <laughs> Wait a second to say simply, my servants, but no one else's. Mm -hmm. That commandment is against slavery. A human being cannot be a slave, should not be a slave to anyone else, if at all is to God. But even then, I believe, should be an act of freedom. My faith to God is an act of freedom. It's very much uh, in the American tradition. I mean, if you think into the 19th century, the um, American slaves, American blacks, would sing Negro spirituals, which were rooted directly, even in words, the in the Old Testament. And <coughs> Franklin Roosevelt, before World War II, talked about the four freedoms. And today, this country has gone to war to protect our freedom, but as in the case with Iraq in 2003, we went to war to try to create freedom in other countries. And President Bush at that time very specifically said that his purpose was to build freedom throughout the Middle East. I'm not taking you into politics here, but the, concept, the concept of freedom is something that has been with America from the beginning. American, America has been influenced by, by, by the Bible, by, by the Jewish, Jewish scripture. It's very, very simple, it's clear. Anyone who studies American history, the importance of, of the Bible mm -hmm. among, among the founding fathers and, and further on, there's no doubt about it. Look, the Bible is a great, it's a great book, <laughs> believe it or not. After all, you know, we are the people of the book. You know who called us the people of the book? Mohammed, mm -hmm. maybe because he had a, a scribe, a scribe called Baruch. <laughs> and therefore, the, I have seen a version of, of the Quran which was hurting, because it was one of them was so silly. And uh, so Moses' sister is Miriam, Mary. Jesus' mother, Mary. And I've seen a version of the Quran saying it's the same million, 1,500 years apart. Right. <laughs> I think they have changed it afterwards. But what would imagine, Ali, that the, one would imagine that given the importance of the Jewish contribution to Western civilization, 
that people ought to be standing on mountaintops now and saying, thank you, Jewish people. <laughs> but they're not really saying that. And in many parts of the world, including this country on occasion, there has been rampant anti-Semitism. Uh, why has there been anti-Semitism? Well, I mean, this is, of course, an urgent question. It has been urgent for so much, so long. I would like, really, in truth, that the two of us could invite the anti-Semite here, here, even a chair, and ask him, why do you hate us? Why should I do his work <laughs> and tell him why he hates us? <laughs> tell us. <laughs> Where are you from? Because the anti-Semitism is the stupidest, the stupidest of all, 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 all racist theories. To say that I am different only because I, 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 I am Jewish. How stupid, how stupid can you be? But the, the, the stupidity of racism and anti-Semitism, well, the role of stupidity in human behavior has not been enough analyzed. That is stupid. And we should do something about it. <laughs> 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 Eli Luther was one of the, is written about as one of the smartest men of his time. Except, flaming anti-Semite. Except, exactly. I, oh, I, look, when you study literature and philosophy and, and yeah, history. Can, it, can one, in discussing the origin or the root of anti-Semitism, do you think about what? Where do you go back? Is it something that related to Jesus' death, was it related to a person? Was it related to a societal need at a certain point to find a scapegoat? What, what do you think lies at the heart of this hate? Believe me, I have attended conferences. I've organized conferences together with my wife, Marion, on, on all kinds of issues, including anti-Semitism, bringing experts. I brought psychiatrists, psychologists, everywhere from all over to explain to be anti-Semitism. It's hatred. Of course, it's hatred. Why? Why? Once I had a, a, a conversation on French television, of course, and at, at the interviewer was a French theologian. And at one point he said to me, look, in truth, really, we are now among friends on television. Why, 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 why do we hate you? And I said to him, look, you are doing the hating, and I should, you tell me, why do you really hate me? <laughs> The anti-Semite hates the Jew because he is too rich, or too poor, <laughs> too famous, or too modest, too ignorant, or too learned, too successful, or too nebich. That means he had all the all the contrary elements exist in the anti-Semite. He cannot say because I have banks. What about the poor? He doesn't because politics, come on. The anti-Semite hates, I think, is almost hereditary. In history, not in people, in history, it's hereditary. Just as it's raining now in the spring, and snow in, snow in the winter, and the anti-Semite is an anti-Semite. There's always an anti-Semite somewhere. At one point, I thought, maybe there are some lands that are fewer. I found one, Japan. We came to Japan. I had a lecture series there. And there I discovered anti-Semitic propaganda. Literally anti-Semitic in Asia. And I asked, there are no Jews there. So I asked my Japanese neighbors or colleagues, explain to me. You don't understand, he said. This is not anti-Semitism as you think it is. Anti-Semitism for you is that we are criticizing, we are blaming you, we are hating you. No, we admire you. Because what does the anti-Semite say? Ah, oh, the Jew is more powerful, he's the richest. We want to be powerful, we want to be the richest. We want to learn from you. Go, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie, talk to me about 
a war that you thought was a good one? A war? A war <laughs> that you thought was a good one. Good war, I don't know. A just war, yes. Hmm? A good war, I don't know. A just war, I know. Tell me about a just war. A just war against Hitler, no doubt. A just war. Mm -hmm. Has the U.S. been involved in unjust wars? I, I cannot tell you that. I really don't know that you know more than I, because what evolved uh, as a journalist more than I, and you, you met the people who, who played the role, roles in all that. I'm against war. I think war is ugly. There is nothing beautiful in war. It can be some noble in war, hero, saving other people's lives. But I, 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 I cannot write, let's say, a song in praise of war. I cannot. I have written after the Sixth War, Sixth Day War in, in, in Israel. I wrote a book, A Beggar in Jerusalem. But it was the beggar. The emphasis, a beggar in Jerusalem. And it's not a heroic, I wrote about it, not a heroic six days. But the life of a beggar. But there are unnecessary wars, which are stupid. <clears throat> and then, of course, there are necessary wars for those who, who have to wage them, like Israel's defense of, of herself against the onslaught in 48 was a just war. Those, those Arab nations that attacked in 1948 Israel that had 600,000 men, women, and children, that's all. And six or seven Arab nations attacked it, whereas Ben-Gurion, David Ben-Gurion, uh, I remember it was a Friday when he made this speech, the, uh, and, and he said, I stretch out my hand to our neighbors to accept the partition plan. The partition plan. I stretch out my hand, accept it, and we shall live in peace with one another. Had he accepted that Jerusalem would not be Jerusalem today? Yes. And yet he accepted it. And who will tell us that Bergoglion was not a hero or, 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 or an idealist or a patriot? Of course not. He felt that is the role of Jewish history then, to accept and then build. So that war was a just war. But in general speaking, wars. But Ellie, there have been other wars of a different sort that Israel has fought. Clearly, the 56 war was not the 48 war, nor the 67 or the 73 or various other no. excursions. 67 was, 67 was. 56, no. 66, unfortunately, was not an Israeli war. But 73. I think that was coming. Because it was a t Israel was attacked. A defense of attack, of course. And you had to fight back for yourself to fight. Actually, well, come on. When you read, I was then at the United Nations. I was a correspondent here. And I remember I, I heard the Arab, Arab leagues, said that Ahmed Shukeri, General Secretary of the Arab League and the other leaders all saying they are going to destroy Israel. Literally, word by word, we are going to destroy Israel. At that time, for one week at least, or ten days, we all lived in fear. We Jews in America, I lived in fear. Because I, I, I learned to trust the enemy's threats. The only experience really, I believe, has to be uh, learned and, and, and evaluated naturally, but, but espoused and accepted. Trust the enemy's threats. And he threatened Israel simply to, to annihilate Israel. Man, woman, and child. I heard him say it in the United Nations. So, of course, Israel had to defend herself. And I remember, I wasn't married yet, and I remember with, with Mary, we, 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 we met already then, just. And when he said it, on the, on the, we heard the speeches. So I said, I want, I want to be there. So I went to Israel right away, to be there when Israel had to fight for its, for its life. Hmm. And then, six days later, of course, Israel won, and how it won. How it won, I don't know. Look, Israel, after all the Jewish people, look. We have a tradition of learning. Good. Even scientists, okay, they are learners. But warriors? Where did we take the genius that Israelis had 
to develop a strategy and, and fight the courage and fight and training to defeat six Arab armies. So naturally, Really, every nation, um, including Israel, finds that on occasion it will have to fight in its own self-defense. And there are times when it's questionable as to whether it's a war of self-defense and could be more a war that others, including members of Israeli society, could define as an aggressive war. When Israel feels as it did seven or eight years ago when it went into Lebanon, that this was a justifiable um, intrusion because without it, there would have been too much of a buildup of Hezbollah's strength. And at a certain point, Hezbollah could really do mortal damage to Israel. And so preemptively, you've got to strike. So there are many different kinds of wars. And since we live in a society that is very open to self-criticism. And we, and I think I could speak for both of us when I say that we are certainly sympathetic um, to what it is that Israel represents. There must be a point at which a nation can say, I have to do what I consider right and in what I consider in my own self-interest. And I don't really care what anybody else thinks. I've got to do what I consider correct. Israel today is under very severe criticism because it does not do what most of the rest of the world would like it to do. And I'm wondering whether in your judgment, I can give you my judgment if you ask, um, Israel has to listen to the rest of the world and be mindful of what it is that the rest of the world says, or else it loses the self-respect or the respect of the rest of the world, and perhaps even its own self-respect. What is your gut feeling about that? Is this what you think, really, what is yeah. that? We should listen to the world. I remember when I was a correspondent at the United Nations. Yeah. I worked as a journalist for many, many years. But I, one day, I remember we were, we were shocked. The news came. The Israeli Secret Service caught Adolf Eichmann in Buenos Aires. A violation of Eichmann, the Argentine suit, right away protested, suit Israel, the United Nations Security Council, everywhere. Come on, of course, it's true. What a terrible thing. Israel sent Secret Service, for fission, Secret Service Israelis, and to kidnap another person there in Argentina. Should I have said, oh, really, why didn't they ask nicely the Argentinian government? To... <laughs> I didn't. I was very, very pleased to hear that. I felt even, as I remember when I had to write about it, and I wrote, I said, I am not always sure that history has a sense of justice, mm -hmm. but it surely has a sense of humor. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> to have Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, be brought to Israel was to me a really marvelous sense of humor. Then I came to cover the Eichmann trial. Every single day I was there. And at one point I looked at him, oh, looked and looked, always looked at his face. I spoke to people who, who treated him. He, he ate well, he slept well, you know, <laughs> behaved like a normal human being. <laughs> But something in his face disturbed me. What disturbed me that I remembered him. Mm -hmm. He had come to see at my town. Mm -hmm. Almost to the day, May, April, May, 1944, mm -hmm. to supervise the last transport of the Jews of Sigurd. I remember all of a sudden a, a rumor went through the ghetto that two German officers arrived. He was one of them. These two German officers came to the train station to see the last transport leaving Sigurd. He was one of them. Mm. And now he's in, in Jerusalem. Not tell me. 
Don't you think history has a great sense of humor <laughs> and justice after all? But that goes for on the higher level as well. Who am I really? The person, the Jew that I am, the person that I am, or the writer that I am, even the witness that I am. Who am I to judge Israel? I who, after all, I cannot dissociate myself from my past. Who am I? Had there been Israel in 1938, there would have been no Auschwitz. Yes. Why wasn't there? It's not that Israel didn't want to. Israel was a Zionist movement. A Zionist movement. The British were against it. Mm-hmm. Had then Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, and the few mobilized and say, look, the Jews deserve it. Not only that. First, they deserve it for historic reasons. Then for good reasons. Nobody wants to save the Jews. Give them a land, let them go there. They didn't. And that happened in our lifetime. Yes. That brings me, therefore, to, to the point that I can't I can really judge. I, I, I cannot judge. I try to understand. Let me share something with you. I know that um, Ted Koppel was sitting here a couple of months ago and talking with you. Ted and I have known each other for a long time, and we have had many, quote, serious conversations. One of those serious conversations is, could a Holocaust ever happen in the United States? And I share with you now the two views. Mine as um, an American born Jew, I said, no, no, it cannot happen here. And Ted, as somebody born in Europe, Um, and for whom that experience perhaps is much closer, said, yes, it could happen in America. I still believe I'm right, and I think him wrong, but the concept is one that is worth studying because America is a changing society. And when I was a kid, that was many years ago, And it was a different country then. It is a different country today. Has it gotten better? Are we as a nation today better? Do we have more grounds to be proud of what is that we represent today than perhaps I would have felt if I was 20 years old? The answer is absolute honesty. I'm not sure, but there is something in the pit of my stomach that says, We are really changing. Things can change. And I know that we have a branch of the Cal family in London. And quite often in family conversations, the senior member of the London group will say, you know, one day we may have to move to America because he feels that anti-Semitism may reach an unacceptable level. But that means in his mind that America is untouchable. And is America untouchable? What is your, what's your feeling about this? Oh, it's so different, really. Come. It's a hard, I'm sorry to... No, 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 but uh, maybe, of course we go in depth, in, into depth all that. Can it happen again? Sometimes I have written About that period, I try to work with regard to the lessons that we have to learn from there in order to prevent future and so forth. Do I think that I do it because I think it could could happen again, meaning a Holocaust again? No. I believe almost ideologically that it is a unique experience a unique event with a capital E, just like the giving of the law at Sinai. It's unique. And therefore, the unicity will save us from that. That cannot happen again. Other things happen. Mm-hmm. Have already happened. Can happen. <coughs> Mass murder, absolutely. We have seen it. 
anti-Semitism, violent anti-Semitism, we have seen it. But what we know what Holocaust meant, really, and I, I'm embarrassed because I think I'm, I'm the one who was, if not the first, that surely among the first, to introduce that term into, into our consciousness about the Holocaust. But it came by accident. I was writing a, a, a essay, an essay on the Akeda, on the binding of Isaac. For the why, for, to give the lecture here at the why. Mm -hmm. And uh, there the expression is that God asked Abraham to bring his son, Isaac, Leola, as a burnt offering. Burnt offering, that means fire, burnt offering. Is it possible that the six million Jews actually were a, a kind of Ola to God? That God wanted that offering, burnt offering? So that's how the, the term Ola. Does it mean that it can happen again? It cannot happen again. Massacres, we have seen them. Injustice, yes. Racism, yes. We haven't learned. Mankind has not learned much, unfortunately. We are trying to teach, but he hasn't learned. We failed, he hasn't learned. But to say that once again, there could be a situation in America, surely, where the, the Senate and the, and the House would adopt a policy, a law, to kill the pe Jewish people? It would come out, really. Now, would a German Jew, let's say, in the 1920s have said the same thing? Probably some of them did. Mm. But nevertheless, I am ready to define my, my faith in America and say it cannot happen here. Maybe that is as simple as history doesn't repeat itself? It did and it does, but to, the, to degrees. But there are certain things, look, we have, we, are, we have done terrible things. I, to this day, when I meet, I had once had two Indian or three Indian students. I felt so bad mm. from Indian, <laughs> Indian tribes. <laughs> what we have done to these poor Indians, for what? For what reason? But we have done it. America, um, an exceptional country. Absolutely. There isn't really another one around, is there? Huh? Like that? No, I really, in truth, his, in history. No, I, I think it's, it's unique. I think the entire experience is unique. And if it be, the next time I see Ted, I'm gonna tell him that I have a supporter. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he won't be able to take me on any longer on that issue. Ellie, before we go to questions, and we'll do that um, in another couple of minutes, I wanted to ask you uh, two things having to do with leaders in Israel and leaders in the United States. Um, you have seen many of them and have been indeed friends of a good many of them. Um, Put yourself back in Israel for a minute. Who was the Israeli, perhaps the Israeli Prime Minister, who impressed you the most, and tell me why? Who oh, have met David Ben-Gurion as a journalist. Who? Ben-Gurion, he was <laughs> one of the greatest. I was then a journalist, and I covered him for my paper. I traveled with him all over America, really, to the country, you know, from from everywhere, they went to Canada. And once we came to Canada, Friday, so we had to spend the Sabbath there. So we ate at this ambassador. And, you know, I thought he was tired. He spoke in Parliament then. I took him aside. <laughs> I said, Mr. Prime Minister, you asked me, they trouble you with your politics. You know what, Mr. Prime Minister, let's go sit down in the corner. I know you love philosophy. Let's talk about philosophy, about Greek philosophy. <laughs> so we spent a few hours talking about philosophy, and that was, I think, the best conversation one could have with the Prime Minister. Not about politics, but about philosophy. Ben Goyon surely was a remarkable man. Begin was a remarkable man. Misunderstood. Begin was a very sensitive, sensitive leader. For him, the, he, he told me once, before, Israel became a nation, and he was the head of the underground, the Irgun. And the British called 
I think two sergeants or two officers. Uh, and they call they call the hostages, double hostages. And he had to give the order to execute the British. Two British uh, majors or, or because they had killed members of his of his organization. In the in the bench, in retaliation. He told me he didn't sleep nights. But he had to give the order. I asked myself then, what would I have thought? <laughs> but you know, the, the um, Begin and Gurian relationship was an extremely contentious relationship. And I'm thinking about especially the blood money argument of Germany. 1952, Germany. whether to take German money. <clears throat> uh, and Begin, of course, took an absolutist position no, we don't take that kind of money. And Ben Gurion was the rational, pragmatic leader. We needed the money, we needed the goods, let's take it. I confess to you, I was on Begin's side then, not politically on that. I was. At that time, I was still a correspondent in Paris for the Diotach or not, and, and there, there was a conference, the first, con Germ the first Israeli German conference was in a place called Bassenar in Holland. And I came to cover it. We were there actually close to the Israeli delegation, the German delegation, and four journalists. I was one of them. In the beginning, there was tension around the table. The Germans and the, and the Israelis took, almost couldn't look one another. Slowly, the ice melted. They were really smiling. <laughs> they were really drinking cognac in the evening. <laughs> and I realized, you know, that look, hostility cannot last. There are two nations, Israel and East Germany. I was against, by the way. I wrote articles against it. Mm -hmm. Not against taking the money. It, was not, it wasn't German money, it was American money. Even, even the German money came from America. <laughs> and Israel needed the money. But that's a good rationalization. Yeah. It did come from Germany. Sure, but I, I wrote articles against it. Tell me about, um, you knew Rabin very well. Rabin was, of all of the Israeli leader, the one closest to a Palestinian leader in trying to get a deal with the Palestinians, with Arafat in the mid-90s. I'm wondering if you felt that if, this is the biggest if in my judgment in, in recent Israeli history, but if Rabin had lived, could he have got the deal? It's possible, because he had such a reputation. He was actually, look, he was the victor of the Six Day War. Mm -hmm. Until then, he wasn't known. And I came, again, I came to Israel during the Six Day War. And I met him. We spent hours. He, the, the problem was, he drank all the time. He had a bottle of cognac all the time. <laughs> While we were talking, from 11 in the evening until 4 in the morning, he finished the whole bottle of cognac. <laughs> it, had, it had no effect on him. He was as lucid, absolutely as lucid, as clear-minded, everything. I liked him very much. We were very, very close friends. Yeah. And when he was killed, I went to the funeral. And I, I remember I went to the funeral, and for a whole, 24 hours, I couldn't utter a word. Mm. I, was, I, I couldn't utter a word. They killed Rabin. Rabin was a great man. A year or so before he was killed, um, he came up to the Kennedy School, and um, there was a dinner before he was to speak before the students. And at the dinner, I felt obliged to tell him that there was a very significant group of pro-Palestinian kids that are going to be in the audience, and he ought to at least be aware of that. He seemed utterly unfazed by the news. And he began his speech by saying, more or less, I know there are a lot of you out there who are not going to agree with anything that I say today. But I am the Prime Minister of Israel. And if you expect me to say anything else, you have my blessing. You can leave right now. Tell me about American presidents who, in say, go back to Reagan, 
Reagan in 1986 was going off to Bitburg and you turned to him at the White House and you said, Mr. President, they are not your people. But he went anyway. Who impressed you the most of all of our presidents from then to now? And you've seen them all, you've talked to them all. <laughs> Listen, I, I, you know, Marion laughs at me because I remained a Jewish refugee at heart. When I see a policeman, I tremble. I've never done anything. <laughs> I don't even drive anymore. I, I'm afraid of a ticket more than anything else. <laughs> I don't drive. I, I'm afraid of, of authority of policemen especially. And yet, when I come to the White House, when I, I began for the first time with Carter, and from Carter on, I saw every single president to this day. And uh, nothing, I, I speak to them, really. We have, usually, we have a kosher lunch. <laughs> but I remember the first time when I, it was Carter still, and I left the White House after this lunch, which I don't eat there, because why do I eat? That's kosher. Like, why? Because when I when he speaks, it's not nice to eat. When he doesn't, I eat. I speak. So I always leave the White House without food. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> I remember the first time I left the White House alone. And it was in, the White, in Washington, I walked in the streets. I said, what's happening here? I, I remained a refugee at heart. Secondly, I'm an American citizen, and I have a tremendous love for America, which I, they gave me a home here. The first time I had a passport in my life, an American passport. And therefore, I respect the presidency and the president. And here I am, I, I have, where do I take the courage to come in the White House and say things to the president? <laughs> you know, it troubled me. I didn't know why I do that. And, I, and the only answer I had is, what else could I have done? I had to do it. I had to say what I had to say. Who was the one who impressed you the most? Oh, don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> who impressed you the least? Don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they all look, look. Again, they, I, res I respect the president. I won't, I won't take it down. I will, I will ask a couple of questions here because we're at that point where um, the question that becomes not me, but in this case, a question from Virginia <coughs> Beach. And it says, hello, Mr. Wiesel, I'm in the eighth grade at Salem, Salem Middle School in Virginia Beach. We've been studying your book, Night. I was wondering how you kept yourself going when you were forced to run over 40 miles overnight in the snow. Well, that, that I can answer you. Later I cannot, but that I can. I was with my father. So I ran together with him. And I knew if I stop, he will stop. And if I die, he will die. Yes. So therefore I had to go. But after my father died, everything changed. A question from Norfolk, Virginia. A lot of us take some of the smallest pleasures for granted. When you finally had freedom after the Holocaust, what was the first thing that you did which you weren't able to do for so many years? Have a good meal. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever tire of telling your story? I don't tell my story. <laughs> I tell other people's stories. Look, I have written only one story, which is night. Mm -hmm. But I have published 60 books. Six when do you books? sleep, Ellie? <laughs> <laughs> Ask Marianne, she goes. <laughs> I sleep, but I look, I lead a normal How many hours sleep do you get in I don't need much, really. <laughs> a question from Framingham, Massachusetts. Why is Israel delegitimized these days throughout the world? Is the reason deeper than just the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? First, it's not all over the world. Let's not exaggerate, really. There are, there are certain countries that, are, that oppose Israel, others are hostile to Israel, but most of the world is sympathetic to Israel. 
which is which is the reality. Why are those who are anti-Israeli? Maybe speak, spoke about hatred, let them explain it. But when they write about it, they would like Israel to become an ideal state. Hmm. Almost only saints should be there. It never commit a sin, <laughs> never make an error. Israel is a nation, mm -hmm. a modern nation, with normal human <laughs> beings. And therefore, whatever exists in other normal societies all also exists there. Israel has its own tailors, its own cobblers, its own industrialists, its own writers, its own poets, its own philosophers, its own uh, shoemakers, and its own uh, miscreants, but all of them, but they live together. Mm -hmm. uh, but you read the Israeli press, really, and I read it usually on Friday, on Friday which is for, should be forbidden because it, it brings me a bad mood for the Sabbath, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when you read it, really, it's normal. It's a normal country with the good and the bad and the less bad. It's to me still a wonder. After 2,000 years, and I always ask the question, where did they take the courage to do that? Uh, in 1948, militarism was denounced. Nationalism was discarded, really. Here comes a little people who says, we want our own nation and our own homeland. Don't even forget the Arabs, which is also a problem, actually. But simply, why? Why now, when we go towards the United Nations? There was even a, a man named Gary Davis who created a universalist movement. He came to Paris. I was in Paris then. I interviewed him <laughs> to abolish all the political movements, to have only one movement, a universalist movement. We are all equal. Beautiful. It's the Bible. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. And here comes a little nation and says, we can show you that we are going to build a nation. Well, of course, we won't be perfect. There is no perfection in life. But we shall try to be a humanistic and human society. Well, there's another, sort of another side to that issue, I think, and it's reflected in this question from Norfolk, Virginia. How is the Jewish concept of freedom reconciled with the plight of Palestinians in the territories occupied by Israel? That is the most difficult question that I yes. asked. It's true, look, it's this difficult. Because it has to do with everything, with, with uh, politics, and with philosophy, and with religion, and history, and morality. Morally, morally, when I'm in Israel, and I, I see an Arab refugee, a Palestinian refugee, I should have sympathy for, and I have. Absolutely, a refugee. I, was, I used to be a refugee. I remained a refugee at heart. And he's a refugee. And actually, he's a young, young refugee who hasn't done anything bad, hasn't killed any Jew. He's simply a refugee because he was born in a family. The fact that we still have refugee camps, to me, is something I don't understand. 70 years later, where are the, the United Nations? Can we create something for that? Look, this is a problem very sad. It's a very sad problem for me. But I don't know the solution. I don't know the alternative. What, was, what should Israel do? Open up and say all of them come in? Look, I used to be in the United Nations, listen to Ahmed Shukeri. You remember Ahmed Shukeri, the PLO leader? Yeah. His speeches, they are going to eliminate Israel from the... How can you, how can you accept him in, in, in Israel? Yeah. But the Israeli government, all the governments, even the Begin government, the Shamir government, I always said, we are ready to make peace, we are, if you are ready. They never wanted that. They never accepted a seat, a seat around the peace table. Does it mean that all that makes me very happy? No. The fact that some people suffer because Israel is happy, 
there's something wrong, but I don't know the solution. So your sense is what? That there is not likely in the foreseeable future that we will see a deal between them? Look, 70 years. It lasts already 70 years. So another 70 years? No, no. I, my, on the other hand, I think there comes a moment when it cannot go on and there will be a peace. I, I am I'm optimistic in the long run. It, it cannot go on like that. Optimistic in the face, not of evidence, but just... My feeling. Just, just my your feeling. feeling. Yeah. Hope you're right. Another question from a 13-year-old, Rachel Kaufman. Do you have any friends you are still in contact with from either camp? Sure. Yes. Not many, you know. Not many. I, 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 before 20 or 30, uh, who went to after the war to the same... After, after Auschwitz, we went to Buchenwald, from Buchenwald, at the Paris, Paris here. A few of them are still alive, and we talk a lot, sure. Both here and in Paris, but in Israel too. Do you meet, and it's sort of a, not every year but or something that, like well, that? We used to. Yeah. I think for the 20th anniversary, we had a gathering in Jerusalem. It was very, very moving. But now we have no telephone at all. I would imagine so. Do you think anything in this world today equates to the Holocaust? No. No. Again, I repeat that. There are other things, terrible things. There are massacres, false imprisonment, injustices. There are terrible things. But none of them really should be called the Holocaust. That would cheapen it. Holocaust was what? With the entire parliament in Germany, with the entire people, the entire society, with the scientists and scholars and, 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 and uh, bankers, they all actually agreed on one thing, how to kill more Jews? No, that cannot happen again. This question sort of flows out of your answer. It's unintentional, but there it is. How has your religious views changed from the time before the Holocaust until now. How do you feel about religion now? What religion I cannot tell you, I can't say what my religion is, I can. I come, as some of you may know if they have read some of my books, I come from a very religious family. Our tradition is that we are descendants of the Baal Shem Tov, literally, family from the master of the good name, the founder of the Hasidic movement. We are this descendants. We are the Hasidic family. I was very pious, very, very pious, studies in Yeshiva. I had payers until, until the ghetto, but we had to cut it. Then came the war. After the war, I came to France, brought by a Jewish organization called the Ose. And the first thing that we asked, we are the, we a group of religious youngsters, teenagers. The first thing we asked is not for a good meal, but for filling. Mm -hmm. And I got filling. And I still have the filling, actually. But I have to press you on that. Between that period of your life and now, you have seen so much more. Has any of that tested you to the point where you question fundamental aspects of your faith? Not my faith, but the questions were actually not so new, they were old. But whatever question I can ask, I can find already a trace of them in our religious literature. You think that Ibn Ezra didn't have questions, that Maimonides didn't have questions, that there are some of them are better than mine. But we believe in questions. There is quest, in question. I love that quest. You know, the word kel is the word she'ela. She'ela means a question. The two, the two verbs, in the, the two letters in the middle is God. God is also in the question. Mm. And of course, may, I may question God. The prophets did that, and we are following in their footsteps from within. If you believe 
and you question, it's okay. If you don't believe, why question? Turn it around the other way, Ali. Rather than the last 50, 60 years of your life raising questions, have those years reinforced aspects of your faith that you never thought before would be to that level? Lately, not, not during, no. not many decades. Lately, as with the years, with the years, mm -hmm. really under the weight of years, they are still reinforced, they are getting deeper, yeah. <coughs> Which means I want to do what my parents did, what my grandparents did. I, I want to follow in their footsteps. That is what I really wanted, and that is simply uh, an evidence. Um, this question takes you in a somewhat different direction toward the front page of newspapers today. What? <laughs> what are your thoughts about the events in the Ukraine? We began talking about it before we came on stage. I am angry. Angry? Very angry at Putin. Absolutely. What is he doing? because he simply is occupying Crimea, because the world let him do it. The Crimeans didn't ask him to come in. What is he doing there? One morning he got up, he said, I want Crimea. I, 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 Putin, to me, therefore, he is a kind of little, little Stalin, very little. But there's some, something of Stalin in him to do that, saying, I dare you. And I'm embarrassed to see nobody report it. America hasn't, Europe hasn't. He can do whatever he wants. Yeah, but Ellie, what would you have them do? At least protest. <laughs> at, at least say, at least make a statement. It's an immoral, it's an immoral thing that you have done to occupy a Statements land like that. have been made by the dozen. Not by leaders. The president has made these statements. Time and on time. that, on, on that? He has On Crimea? No. Tell me, I may be wrong, I haven't seen it. No, no, no. Uh, he has been explicit in denouncing the Russian takeover of Crimea. The president? He's called it illegitimate, then, illegal. Then I apologize, I haven't seen it. Yeah, but I think the question uh, comes up in this next one here. What do you think the U.S. involvement should be to discourage Russia's president from acting like Hitler. That I don't like. I don't compare. You do not compare? Of them. course not. Nobody can be compared to Hitler. Okay. It cheapens the whole thing. Um, I'll take you back to where we were before. 28 years ago, when your Nobel Prize, you addressed the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians and said, I trust Israel for I have faith in the Jewish people. Can you address the current and continued stall in the peace talks, and if how your faith in the Jewish people has changed over the years? My faith in the Jewish people hasn't changed. I must, but I continue above it and around it. I have, my faith in humanity hasn't changed. I had good reasons to lose that faith, at least in humanity, at least in that. So after all, human beings did it. So how can I respect their humanity? But nevertheless, I don't. We couldn't go on living like that. So therefore, I say, okay, I swallow, and I say, they have done it, but now I try to understand why. And we don't know why, really, you know. We know everything about that period, the how. We know the how. How it happened since 36, 38, and then how it happened during the first years there in the camps and what they have done in, 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 the, in Berlin. We know how, but not why. Why did they do it? Why did it happen? The why remains. It's the biggest question is why, yeah. always. I don't know why. Whatever the issue, why? Why, always why. Another question. How much responsibility do we as a country have to free other nations and peoples globally. Well, I think I, this may go back to the 2003 
war. Yeah, but Marvin, I am, you know, I, I've been involved in so many human rights activities for the last 20, 30 years, naturally. I, as a Jew, as an American citizen, I have, I feel I have a duty to help those who don't have these rights. And I went to all kinds of places, naturally, to, to do that. Without much success, but at least I was there to protest yes. and to bear witness. Yes. Um, another question here. Forgive me, I have to work my way through this. You have spoken extensively on hatred and your lack of hatred for those who have personally oppressed or imprisoned you. Can you speak to the, to the sense of personal freedom that you are able to obtain from not trapping yourself in the cycle of hate? Why is the cycle of hate so important to end personally and politically? But it's, it's an easy solution usually. It's a very easy way out. Hatred is very easy. Yeah. And I don't think this is the answer. Hatred should never be the answer. If I see an injustice, I try to fight it with all my heart, with all the means I have at my disposal, mobilizing the friends that I have. It's an injustice. But hatred somehow has never entered the picture. And therefore, I can tell you as an adult person, or even in my adolescence, I don't think I've ever had hatred, really. Anger, yes. Mm -hmm. Anger I can have, but not hatred. What does Elie Wiesel say to, to, I can't, G6, G-O, oh, forgive me. What does Elie Wiesel say to God after 120 years? <laughs> oh, from the son of Herling number 1048 of Auschwitz. You know, we are supposed to, to ready our, at one point, ready ourselves when we appear be, before the celestial court, the celestial tribunal, and answer all kinds of questions. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? Oh, well, they'll have a lot of questions. And many, many questions, I'm sure, will be objectionable because it's sinful. Who knows what sins I have committed in my life? And there, for the only time, I will, when I will listen to one of them, I said, you, Mr. God, where were you then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the uh, accusation, I hope, yeah. will be dropped. Um, Ellie, I'm finished with um, the other questions, but I have a final one for you. You have been- Ominous, final questions and ominous. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is just a question, not a solution. Um, but you have been here for more than 40 years, speaking at the 92nd right. Street Y, and you've been teaching right. for about that period of time. So you've come upon generations of young people passing through your classroom. So I have two questions. One, what do you think you left them with? And what, as you look out now over the young people whom you see in a classroom or just on the street. What is it that you would like to leave with them? What is it that is so important that grips you so deeply that you'd like to grab each one by the lapel and say, please think of this? If you, if you ask, I'm sure if you ask any of the students if I had them, I had hundreds of them in my life. I'm sure they will answer you that I favor questions. Mm -hmm. I, I, want, I want to teach them the art of questioning. It means I'm not responsible for answers, but for questions I am, and therefore I want to teach them the questions. It, it is the most important thing, I think, in life, is to be able to question. It is what the question humanizes, the answers dehumanizes. So therefore, that is what I would like to teach, really. And uh, I meet occasionally students of mine it's a joy. For me, it's a joy. Uh, not recently, recently I had a student came up to me, came to see me in my office here in New York, and I was so moved. 
He came with Auntie asked to see me. I see everyone. Do you remember this? Of course I remember. Where are you? How? I said, look, I know your name. Do you remember me really? I said, of course I know. You know, you were, I know, I'll tell you when you were there. I will give them my lectures. Where you were sitting, there in the corner. What else do you remember? I said, I remember that there was a girl there next, but not very far from you. How do you know? And so one day I saw that you were pushing a flower to her. She is my wife now. <laughs> okay, what can I do for you? He said, nothing. Then why are you here? He said, because yesterday my wife and I were in bed. It was Sunday. And the morning was schmoozing, and we said to each other, look how happy we are. We have to thank God how happy we are. Look, we are married, we have children. We have positions, both of us. And then she says, but you know, we owe, also, we owe it also a little bit to Professor Fizel. <laughs> <laughs> she said, it's true, naturally. So he, she said, why don't we go to thank him? So they threw a lot of something, who should come in? So she came in, sitting, that's why I'm here for my husband and myself. Just one thing, to say thank you. And she left. Yeah. So thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you very much.